listeners, welcome to the Kyle and Victoria's Call Cinema Cast. Uh, I'm Kyle. Ooh, I'm Victoria. Yeah, Victoria. Yeah, Victoria's back this week. Uh, yep, uh, after uh, shock treatment, which was the last thing yep, she was that on. That was the last one I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, we're doing like the Christmas week episode, which will be which uh, so to pick some with her. Yeah, uh, yeah, we got something with Santa Claus in it. Also, Jack Frost. Yeah, and I let, the Easter uh, Bunny. And Easter Bunny. And honestly, this is a bit more of an Easter movie because it takes place around East, uh, like uh, around Easter. Yeah. <laughs> so I had forgotten that actually. Yeah, it's just that all the um, the cool characters are from Christmas, uh, are Chris are winter themed, and it's like takes place in clearly like a wind a place where April's like a wintry month. Which isn't the place, which isn't the case everywhere. It is here. Yeah, it is here. Um, I remember uh, in university, I had a uh, toward the end of like the fall semester, the summer semester, the spring semester, which uh, ends like the v- v- just bare like ends at the end of April. And he came to me like um, last week of March, and he's just like, "Hey, when does the snow melt around here?" And I'm like, "Oh, it'll be gone. Uh, it'll be gone by the time yeah." you go back to China and and I I was wrong. I lied to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was way too optimistic. So, uh this is a we're doing the film Rise of the Guardians, which is a 2012 uh, 3D animated movie by Dreamworks Animation, directed by what's the uh Peter Ramsey. He is uh, actually an interesting thing I came across with this. He's um, the first uh, black director to produce an animated film of this scale in terms of budget. Really? So that's yeah, apparently. Um, oh, that seems like, that I, seems I don't way think I don't like long over. I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that he's like. I doubt he's the first uh, black uh, African American director or African African American director to uh, direct an animated movie just of this scale. I think. Right. Okay. What I'm getting the impression of. It's uh, based on a uh, series called The Guardians of Childhood um, by William Joyce. This is kind of like a sequel to those books is the impression I get from uh, reading stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, They did that so like this doesn't compete with uh, the books. So I'm getting the impression the books star the um, the rest of the Guardians that aren't Jack Frost, who's introduced in this movie, or at least is becomes a focal point in this movie. I don't know if he's in the earlier ones for sure, because obviously I haven't read the books. Uh, you guys say anything? Oh, I just was going to say I haven't either. I didn't even know it was a book yeah. series. Yeah, um, I think it was released... Not totally in tandem with the movie, but I think the first the books only like started coming out in like 2011. He was actually going to co-direct this at one point, but uh, his daughter passed away. His daughter's actually uh, the movie's actually dedicated to her, so that's oh, oh, that's really sad. Yeah, at the end of the movie, it says uh, dedicated to whatever her name was. I can't recall, but yeah. So yeah, he yeah he he was gonna uh, co-direct this, but he moved into like a more supporting role after that. Box office, uh, that's kind of important. Why this is uh, why it's allowed to be on this show. It uh, at first glance, it appears to have made a uh, uh, mild profit. Its uh, budget is one hundred forty-five million dollars U.S. and uh, its box office was three hundred and six. 306 million almost 307 million dollars which uh as you know from the as the previous listeners will know you gotta double your money in order to make money at the theaters and this does do that just barely but i guess the advertising campaign uh put them under oh there's (laughs) yeah yeah like um they had like an extra 83 million in advertising that didn't get paid for or something like that's, that. That's that's rough. Yeah, uh, it happens. Um, so yeah, I don't think this is getting a sequel anytime soon. Then again, um, if they were, maybe if this had like nines across the board instead of like um, 
I think it's like 7.3 on IMDb, 75 on Rotten Tomatoes. If this had like nines in reviews, you might have been able to revive that and had like um, word of mouth, uh, like power the sequel forward. That might have been a thing. But yeah, I don't know sequel wise yet. Do you, would you, okay, I've got a question. Would you actually yep. want a sequel? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what you do with it. Could be fun, though. Wouldn't be the worst thing. Yeah, I'd watch I, it. I, I, I think I'd watch a sequel, too. I don't know if I'd, like, want to advocate for a sequel. Like, I'm not going to sign any, I don't know, like, um, pledges or anything like that. But but I think a sequel might be fun, like, for this, this movie. It's, it's cute. And I could see taking, you know, like, my nephew to see this. Or a sequel to this in theaters, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, watching this, I could sit through another one of these. That could, yeah, that could be done. That's not too bad. Or like a prequel, maybe. But that would take out Jack Frost, probably. Yeah, I really, I really just want more Jack Frost. Yeah, he, yeah, you'd have to go with a sequel to this, which I think is what they'd probably go with. I don't re- I The attitude I got get from like uh, William Joyce is that he doesn't want um the film to compete with the book. Which I think is a fair thing, because anytime you adapt a book, there's people that um like are just like, oh, the book's better. I'm among them. I've done it. We've all done it. Let's admit it. Um, and he's just like, eh, let's just have them coexist, and that'll be fine. Which I can get behind. Um, kind of like uh, kind of like an event thing where like, oh, this stands. Kind of like how they're doing event comics now in modern day comics, where they don't really worry too much about uh keeping the things unified but they'll put them on and give it i guess given the real i've gone way too far with this analogy or way several different directions with this analogy it's kind of like the star trek movies where they're part of the series but are separate enough and like you don't necessarily need to consider them all the time I, I'm sorry. The the, uh, the movie Rise of the Guardians is like the Guardians of Childhood books because of Star Wars movies and books or or because of Marvel or because of comics and books. I I got real tangled up in that. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, we'll move on. Uh good looking movie. Yeah, they used um like pioneered some like uh particle effects for this. Um to do like um the character uh, there's a, like a bunch of dream animations that are uh, animated by like a bunch of sand which they developed new technology to do which i think turned out very well cool uh, yeah uh yeah i think we'll get into the plot i don't really have a it'll be easier to move on when we got things so rise of the guardians uh we open our film to uh monologue by jack frost played by chris pine which um I have a little bit of a question about his like uh casting for this. I think they could have gone with like um an actor with like a younger voice. He seems uh old for this, to be fair. Like I think it's works better than a lot of other guys might have, but he just seems like a little bit um I get depression Jack Frost is more of a teenager and I don't buy like uh this Chris Pine voice is a very teenage voice. I think they could have gone with something younger. I feel like wouldn't it be so fun to hear Tom Holland do um Jack Frost? I feel like Tom Holland would be a really great fit for that character. Yeah, yeah that could work. Um yeah. No, it wouldn't be bad to see him in a good movie. Um What? <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> I've only seen yeah, him in the Spider Man, so I can't like speak to the whole thing. That them be fighting words, Kyle, Mister Kyle. Hey, if they want me to, if if they want me to like the movies, they should uh, stop making me sit through an episode of Hannah Montana to go watch them. Hey, I like Tom Holland. I think he makes a fantastic Spider Man. Oh, he he's fine. It's the it's the entire project I have a problem with. It's like, oh you know, goodness. he does a fine <laughs> job. It's just the the plot and the episode of Hannah Montana I have to sit through every time I watch one of these movies. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Ah, my goodness. Like I said, I'd like to see okay, him in a good wow. movie. That's wonderful. So great. 
<laughs> I just uh, we we gotta move on because like dude dude really uh, yeah I would okay I, I don't care I mean you think okay wait I I have a question now you think that yeah. Rise of the Guardians would qualify as a better movie than like Spider Man Homecoming or or like yes. Avengers. <laughs> oh no! Because oh, the, I'm sorry. The, I guess the the, the um with with Spider Man. Yeah, three and yeah, three and three point five are good. Avengers three and three point and three point five are good. I'll give him that. Okay. I just care for any of the other three ones that he was in. Yeah, because I'm like, because dude, like you would you would end up like, yeah, like if because because the original question the original question was tom holland playing jack frost in rise of the guardians and you were saying that that movie would be easier to watch tom holland in than like spider-man yeah no i'm thinking of like wow. the spider-man movie specifically when i say that wow okay <laughs> i disagree but that is okay and like he's he's fine in like civil war our friendship has withstood. Our friendship has withstood so much, including, including around the world in eighty days. So I think we can. I think we can live through this difference of opinion. He's all right in um, Civil War. I don't think he's remotely the problem with that movie. But that's that movie is just bad in general. Yeah, it's not my favorite. That's for sure. Yeah, no, I, I've talked about that. We'll move on. <laughs> yeah. So Jack Frost is giving a monologue about um the moon like the man the moon um calling to him chasing essentially we get the impre uh, get the knowledge that he has amnesia that he doesn't remember who he was he just woke up one day sitting in the water un uh, under a bit of cracked uh, hole in the ice so clearly this uh kid had uh, fallen through the ice and drowned at some point okay i i do you think okay i'm um, that was my initial take on it too, but I actually, after, after watching the second time, like preparing for this, um, I wondered if he hadn't actually drowned completely because initially I thought, oh, it's so like beautiful. It's such an allegory for like death and rebirth and renewal. And, you know, like all, I was very like philosophical with it the first time I watched, but then the second time I watched Rise of the Guardians, um, I think Tooth Fairy talks about how, like, we were all chosen because of blah, blah, blah. And, and like, when he goes into the water, he's only in the water for, like, three seconds. <laughs> so, he, like, he oh. doesn't even have time to drown before, before he's turned into a mystical frosty man. I don't think that's true, actually. Because um, when we see him revived, um, I'm pretty sure it's dark out. Like when we at the beginning of the at the beginning of the scene of the movie, it's sort of like, like sort of dark out. Um, when we get a scene in the movie that later, which shows him uh, uh, falling through the ice, and that's taking place during daytime. Uh, oh, and like we oh, I see yeah. what you're saying. And, like, so he was in there. Yeah, and gotcha. we don't know that um, they did that immediately either. That could have. Uh, we just know that there was still a hole in the ice, so that could he could have been revived like hours later depending on what the temperature was because ice will freeze over again but um he did fall through the ice so it might have been a warmer day so the ice might have refrozen over so right okay i i i per, to be perfectly honest i prefer the idea that this um explores like death a little bit like i think that um as, like we don't talk enough about grief and loss and death in our society and so I don't mind that a kids movie like would introduce those concepts because it's doing it in a really like gentle and fun and safe way um but I just the second time I watched it I thought oh well, maybe that's not what they're trying to do you know like I, I second guessed that so um I can get behind the idea that Jack Frost drowns oh I yeah um I think, uh, I also think that's maybe, like, an excuse for why he lost his memory. Because I think, um, near-death experience people, they, uh, 
they can sometimes like uh, get some short term memory loss. So if the guy did the whole thing, I think yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I I do seeing as we're talking about like the man on the moon and such right off the hop because the man on the moon is the person or the thing or the the magical being I suppose that like seems to be in charge of the guardians right like is kind of like their handler <laughs> um and selects the guardians and like kind of nudges them along the plot it really bothers me that the moon is a man in this and i know the man in the moon is like a piece of folklore um like all the you know all the characters in this tooth fairy easter bunny sad man santa except he's called Chris Kringle in this one, or is he called Father Nick, St. Nick? I don't he's know. Called, he's called North. They call okay, him so North. North. That's a little weird. Um, but, like, Santa and then Jack Frost, like, they're all, they're all fo- like, characters from folklore and, like, popular children's folklore, specifically. So I understand that the Bat in the Moon is, like, picked to be a part of that, but from my, like, from my um, understanding of, like, witchy folklore, I guess. Like, the moon is traditionally a feminine, um, symbol, and the sun is usually portrayed as, like, a masculine symbol, and so, (laughs) so the fact that they're, like, referring to the moon as a man or, like, with male pronouns for this entire movie really bothered me, so that's my critique about the freaking man in the moon. He's, He's not feminine enough. It's supposed to be a feminine power, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, he. I get the impression that he's the um, like real, very much the uh, capital G God allegory in this, um, and that's the position he's filling, more than like a particular out uh, allegory. And I get a very um, a very like uh, Judeo Christian vibe from like the uh, or Abrahamic vibe from this. Um, uh, mythology uh, they've created here, like it's uh, obviously it's Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, uh, which aren't like um, necessarily uh, traditionally Christian figures, but they very much uh, I think operate under that assumption in a way. Um, and yeah, that makes I sense. Think, yeah, yeah, and like um, it really kind of sold me. Uh, what sold me on this idea was like when we got went to get into the uh, Easter Bunny's lore in this, where like um, he represents uh, like his um, he, uh, they get into a talk about uh, what's the center of these characters beings, and uh, the Easter Bunny's ones was hope that they mentioned, and I think that's um, very much you can construe that with like the um, understanding of uh, the Easter tale and like uh yeah the rebirth and like that yeah so i think that kind of works for there obviously it's different there's no like uh G- like straight up uh jesus character in this unless you count uh <laughs> jack kind of i mean jack frost is resurrected <laughs> and he True. becomes the savior so <laughs> so maybe yeah it, it, i get like kind of like a C- like a lewis vibe from this a bit mm. Um, maybe not like obvious, I like, like I don't know that, um, yeah, I don't know that, uh, what's his name? William Joyce is like that much more religious, like that kind of religious, but, uh, I think I get like a kind of like similar world building vibe from him. And I think right. that can work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I just, uh, I, my, my issue, like my overall issue with this is that, like, there's only one female character that really is named mm-hmm. and has a speaking part in this. Like, this movie does not pass the Bechdel test. There's no, there's no romance, but there, but there just aren't any female characters except for the Tooth Fairy, right? Like, everyone else is a man or a boy. And there's one, like, there's the sister, the little, there's a few sisters, but they, they're little and don't have much screen time. And so I was like... It would have been so easy to make the moon a feminine, like, thing, right? A feminine force of nature because it's already considered a feminine force of nature. And then just change the pronouns. But then I guess, like, thematically, you're not falling in line with, like, the folklore around all the, all the like, nice, tidy 
Santa and Easter and tooth fairy kind of stuff right so I can I can make allowances for it but for some reason it just really bothered me this last time that I watched it so you started talking about the man in the moon and I was like I've got a bone to pick with the man in the moon yeah that's fair so yeah that's the um thing uh he emerges yeah we I haven't even gone through the past four seconds yet we just talk about this so much <laughs> which is great I think <laughs> uh so yeah he uh revi yeah he is um we're getting an image of like his uh jack frost's uh conception essentially um as make into making him a magical being he yeah we get the information about him having amnesia and like uh the man of the moon being responsible for this and he kind of like emerges from the uh the pond uh he's like a white-haired man with like no shoes on either so he's kind of like got this uh hobo -y exterior a little bit so he's which kind of works there's folkloric uh s like tradition to base that on and uh he has like a kind of like a question mark shaped uh staff which is the best shape for a staff question mark staffs are the best i'm a big fan and we uh we get uh introduced to his power set he can make frost and like uh ice and whatnot and he can fly and then we're later introduced to the idea that he can, uh, like a little bit later, we get the idea that he can throw snowballs at people and make, and like give them uh, an urge to go have fun. So that's the thing later. So he flies around with uh, his magic staff and a little bit and uh, shows up and flies toward a village. And uh, that doesn't react to him at all which is a little bit weird and you think oh yeah maybe this is a bit of a fantasy story and like they're just used to this which to a degree i think they are but we'll get into that uh so he walks in and tries to get like a bit one of the villagers attention who proceeds just to walk straight through him so uh he's kind of got like a ghost thing going on yeah and then we get like a 300 years later and we're put into the north pole that's our introduced ducks to jack we uh, cut over to uh, Santa Claus, who's um, called North in this. He is Russian for some reason, instead of being uh, Canadian like he should be. Yeah, doesn't everyone know that Santa lives in Canada? Like, he has a post office code and everything. Oh yeah, yeah, no, exactly. You know what I thought would be weird? We never, we've never done, like, um, an Inuit Santa Claus, have we? I don't think anyone's ever done that. Ooh, no. The the closest um um would be Klaus. You know, have you seen Klaus on Netflix? I haven't. Um and and it's like it's it's like a Scandinavian kind of setting, like a a British slash Scandinavian setting. And there's um oh the the name is escaping me, but they're like northern tribal. I'm going like I can't remember what they're called, but um, it's really really cute, Kyle. You should watch it. I'm going to Google it while we talk because we have time for me to Google things. <laughs> maybe eventually, maybe if I have time, I gotta watch. Uh, I got a DVD called Nutcracker Fantasy. I gotta watch, and that's gonna be my Christmas thing. Oh, you should definitely watch, like, even just for enjoyment, you should watch Klaus, because it's all about, like, it's kind of like the origin story of of the Santa Claus mythology, and it's all about how this, like, ridiculous postmaster starts writing letters to Santa to, like, save his butt and get him to a fancier, like, more cushy lifestyle because he's been stranded in the north and he hates it there and and he makes friends with this toy maker who's the santa claus character but is like really like he's mysterious and grouchy <laughs> and so they end up like becoming this unlikely partnership duo and they kind of save the town that he's been posted in it's so cute and the they're they're sami people that's who they are so um, there's like a tribe of Sami people who live near the community and it's so cute because they speak like all the characters that are Sami speak their language and um, like are trying to interact and they get toys for their kids too and it's just oh 
it's so cute but that i think would be the closest we've gotten to having like a northern um people be involved in like the santa story they're not inuit because they're not from canada um but they're they're sami which i think are pretty like i think they're maybe related even i've heard that before i can't remember but it's really cute and like really distinctively like it was a very thoughtful choice i thought in that movie anyway we're not here to we're not here to talk about klaus but plug for that tv show also an animated children's christmas cartoon so um yeah we've cut to yeah north who's played by uh alec baldwin i can't remember if he did anything shady or not i can't remember mm, um, not really no i don't think so yeah i don't know uh something i can remember anyway um yeah he's building some sort of uh model train set out of ice uh it, overlooking like his office which has this ma fancy uh globe thingamajiggy with like lights on it and whatnot it's kind of neat it's um like very uh geometric globe um like uh all the continents have like sharp edges and like are very simplified which is kind of nice i like a neat map it's a neat map and it starts to in this uh globe starts to get covered in a uh dark cloud which envelops it and uh, this causes some shock to Santa Claus, which is justifiable, I think. So he wanders around. This little spirit, like, uh, laughs and leaves the globe behind. And he decides to uh, call up the rest of the uh, Guardians via Aurora Borealis. And that causes him to summon uh, the Easter Bunny, who's Australian for some goddamn reason. Uh, like that makes even less sense than the. I, uh, I like that he was. I I just I just I don't. Like know, it doesn't. It makes. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I I will defend the Australian Easter Bunny because I thought it was quite charming, actually, and it might just be because I have a thing for the Australian accent, but I thought it was really cute. Uh, Hugh Jackman plays uh the Easter Bunny uh Bunnymund Bunnymund. And, yeah, I just uh, think it like, wait, okay, I get the uh, Santa Claus being Russian because that's also kind of far north. But why would the Easter Bunny be Australian? Because he's from down under. <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> but I think that's what they're. I think that's what they're playing with is that he's like, he's from like he he has that like magical underground thing, right? Like he taps his foot and portals open and he can travel all the way around the earth underground somehow um so i think that's what they're playing with is that like australia is like the land down under i don't know <laughs> that would be my yeah. only rational explanation <laughs> yeah you win this round because of the pun um <laughs> so yeah he's one of them he's got like boomerangs and whatnot uh and then we get uh the tooth fairy played by ilsa fisher who's uh a hummingbird person, hummingbird folk, which uh, seems like a that'd be a fun D and D race. I think so, and and I think it it's kind of cute. It's like a it's an interesting um, take on like the tooth fairy because she's like half fairy, half hummingbird. It's pretty cute. Hummingbirds are nice. They're nice birds, and she has like little uh, little hummingbirds that help her collect teeth. Yeah, they freak me out a little bit. The, yeah, there's one called Baby Tooth that, like, follows around the crew for the whole movie, so... And then there's uh, Sandy the Sandman, who does dreams, and he's, like, got a whole sand motif. He does not have a voice actor, because he's just a silent character, which this movie probably has too many of, because the man the moon doesn't speak either, so... Which kind of annoyed me that they were doing that. And Baby Tooth also. Also, yes. Yeah, so we're doing that a lot in this movie, which I don't really care for. Um, it's not so bad with Sandy, but um, I don't know. I just, uh, and like Baby Tooth is, of course, just a bird. So that's a thing. And then, I don't know, the man, the mood just being annoyed me because he doesn't do anything besides the inciting incident and just expects everyone to like uh like uh figure shit out on their own and doesn't explain anything you know typical god bullshit gee kyle tell us how you really feel yeah. 
Kyle's anyway. like, I got a bone to pick with you, Matt in the Moon. You can get in line, buddy. I already have issues with him. So yeah, essentially their whole thing is that they um, protect the children in the world um, and make them happy, and uh, they're fueled by kids believing in them, which uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense as this goes on. That just that explanation just degrades as we go on, because like if they believe in you, you can see them, but uh, the second like anything goes wrong everyone stops believing in these people despite that like easter and christmas and the tooth fairy are like clearly magical in this world like the parents do not replace the teeth under kids beds or hide the easter eggs so clearly there's some sort of magical being at this at, at work here and yet like okay, no one's doing this. We must know it's some magic thing. And then they stop believing in it because it doesn't happen once. Which doesn't make any goddamn sense. Because, like, okay, magic's been proved. You don't need to, like, constantly do a magic trick in order to prove that you're magic. Clearly do magic shit every five seconds. It doesn't make sense why they... Everyone just gives up on them after not working once in a thousand years. Bugs me. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a very that's a very fair point. Um, it is maybe the like major flaw in this story is that like you can't have it both ways, right? You can't have it that parents are still somehow involved in these holidays, but then after like one time the parents don't do it and there's and there's no belief anymore or like the other way way where like you said it's magical everyone accepts that it's magical parents aren't putting money under the pillows or hiding easter eggs so they know it's magical too and then the one time it doesn't happen it's like oh we totally give up <laughs> on all the magic right so i i get what you're saying i think that's totally a fair observation realistically with like the information i've been provided there should be like a part where like um like a guy comes into like the oval office is just like mr president mr president there uh the easter eggs didn't show up there was no easter bunny this year and then um um the guy would be like oh no that's terrible we must uh pretend nothing's happened and then like complain ever tell everyone that because there's no Easter, because there's no Easter eggs, that means Easter's still happening, and they have to, like, deny what's happening right in front of them, because uh, I am, uh, they need to do what I say, and then I look like the powerful person, and then I will be the new Easter bunny. Ah, I don't know. Where am I going with this? It's just the president of the United States inventing, like, the White House um, Easter picnic or whatever because he's trying to like usurp the easter bunny's position <laughs> that is something donald trump would do let's be honest he's hungry uh, for power yeah <laughs> and chocolate and cheetos and mcdonald's apparently what time what a time to be alive hey kyle one more month you little shit one more month run you can hide mm -hmm. but they will find you we will tear you from your home Okay, we, we talked about United States politics last time I was on the show, so we should talk about this delightful children's movie. Besides, it's still 2012, but Obama's president, so... So uh, Santa Claus explains that uh, Pitch is back. Pitch is like an ancient enemy of the Guardians, I suppose. Um, he is the boogeyman, which uh, they don't call him that. Because this movie has a weird thing where it, uh, they give these uh, fancy people different names, even though uh, they already have fancy names. I don't know why we're calling him. And not, I mean, Boogeyman's not a silly name, but yeah, well, and not and not consistently because the Tooth Fairy is still called the Tooth Fairy, and Sandman is still called Sandman. And they just get, like, cutesy, smaller versions. So Tooth Fairy is called Tooth, and Sandman is called Sandy. But, like, very similar to their names, right? So it's, like, not consistent that the names are changed. Yeah, it's really just, like, a, a North, who is Santa Claus, and uh, 
pitch black who's the boogeyman which is the weird thing and the boogeyman's obviously a big nightmarish figure he's um powered by fear and he wants to make up everyone not believe in santa claus anymore sounds like i'm making a joke but no that's the that's actually the plan it's also th- it's also mentioned here that it's three days before easter so that's up um which would this make that would that make this good friday or wait i, I guess it, i think it depends on friday saturday sunday monday so like well it depends on when you celebrate easter like if you're celebrating on easter sunday or if you're celebrating on easter monday yeah, I don't know how that works. Uh, so a little thing about the North Pole. Um, the North Pole is run by Yeti instead of elves. Uh, the elves are there, but they're just these dumb little hat creatures that don't do anything. Um, but the Yetis do all the work, which is weird because Yetis are from the Himalayas. Himalayans, they're not <laughs> um, from up north. I don't think... Uh, yeah, no, uh, Bigfoot creatures don't usually go that far up north. I don't know of any that are, like, from the Arctic. Bigfoot is also Canadian, so there. Yeah, yeah, he is. Just um, like Santa. Yeah, he, yeah he's uh, Rocky Mountains, uh, so he wanders throughout those. So, yeah. If anything, he'd have, like, he uh, doesn't really need a passport because he's, like, um, some of those First Nations that can go off, uh, that can cross the border without a passport because... Their traditional lands are like in, on both sides of the border, so they have a bit of free movement there. So yeah, it's, I think it, he, it works like that. Not that they could ever catch him if he was. It's a similar system, you think? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, not that you could try, not that you could stop him. I mean, he's um, like you can't find him. He gets away. He gets away from you. If like a bunch of like dumbasses on uh, the documentaries can't find him, what hope does the government have? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because because it's not the government that knows everything. It's a bunch of like backwoods hicks that uh, just uh, make up random video documentaries about where Bigfoot is. Have you seen the Patrick Gimlin film? That's not like he wasn't a hick, and that also not Canadian. But besides the point, I have not seen any of the. I haven't watched a Bigfoot documentary in years. More of a high school thing I was doing. Yeah, the Patrick Gimlin film is like the like piece de resistance of Bigfoot sighting filmography, if that's a thing. And it's uh, like quite, as I understand it, it's like a big deal in Bigfoot circles, which I am not, like I am on the fringes of. I just know enough to sound cool. <laughs> this is my definition of cool. So yeah, we're introduced to all of them. Um... So the man in the moon has to pick a new guardian because that's what it wants to do, even though it doesn't talk. It says that Jack Frost is going to be the guardian because after 300 years of letting uh, Jack Frost wander around the world with no memory, he's finally going to get him to do something. Finally giving him purpose that he hasn't had for 300 years because this is how... uh, Yeah, that seems like a total... That's like a total use... A good use of that, those talents and magical abilities. No, uh, yeah. No, who needs simplicity? I like certainly not anyone with uh, all the power in the world. No, no. Let's not uh, do the reasonable thing that doesn't leave a uh, young man completely confused and uh, without purpose. That never ends in bad things. Young white men being confused and without purpose. Nothing bad ever happens when that happens. And he is white, white, like, <laughs> like Snow White. Yeah, because he froze to death. <laughs> I just have no patience for the man in the moon shit. <laughs> so we cut back to Jack Frost. He's become like sort of a uh, prankster figure. Uh, he's uh, getting a bunch of kids to uh, get into a snowball fight because that's what he's doing. Eventually, he uh, accidentally gets a kid uh, to f- fall into like a traffic and he like uses like ice magic to direct this uh, kid on, uh, falling on a sleigh through a bunch of traffic, narrowly avoiding death, and eventually resulting in this kid losing a tooth. Again, a really good use of his magical abilities. Yeah, I mean, they were having fun with the snowball fight. And he did stop that, uh, he did also stop a uh, character who's a bit of a bully and turns her good for the rest of the movie. Yeah, okay, sure, yeah, I... I'll allow that. I mean, I don't love the idea of ice slides in the middle of traffic for children, but but I, I get behind, like, 
anti-bullying campaigns via snow magic. He he's vaguely chaotic good. I think he's the poster child for chaotic good. Yeah, but uh he yeah, he still has no one able no one's able to see him because uh no one believes in him because that's how uh this works. So he's been manipulating events. Uh these character uh, these kids we're seeing are like a bunch of recurring characters throughout the movie. Uh, we come back to them several times, uh, mostly because the main character, uh, the main child, uh, Jamie, is, uh, like a kid who, uh, like, believes in everything, including Bigfoot, um, which again, weird, because, like, Santa Claus is, like, objectively a thing in all those, uh, in all these world, in this world, so it's not weird that, like, You'd believe in this thing that's behind, like, a magical phenomena. And, like, them getting seen isn't really a big deal. It's like, oh, we shouldn't really do it, but it's not a big deal. It keeps the rumors going. We also get a, uh, like, a demonstration of Sandman's powers. Uh, he blows sand everywhere, and sand gets into, uh, like, uh, people's... And sand manifests uh, people's dreams. Uh, so you can see their dreams happening above their heads, which is demonstrated for us by uh, uh, the sand dancing above the uh, bully girl's head in like the form of a unicorn, where we get our first uh, full image of Pitch Black, who's um, actually got a really decent character design. He's kind of like um, a shadow with like just uh, bits of... Like, with a face, eventually, and, like, yeah, he easily, like, leans in and out, and, like, you see different parts of him based on where he's leaning. So I think he's actually a really cool-looking effect, and he manages to get a hold of uh, the little girl's, uh, or the bully girl's, like, unicorn dream, and turn it into a nightmare. Like, nightmare, as in mare, as in horse. Uh, and those are kind of, like, yeah, the grunts this, for the movie. And this is my favorite part of pitch blacks um like character design slash lore because nightmares like from a folklore traditional kind of perspective were actually like very close to what were portrayed in the movie like the idea of like a smoky horse um and like the reason they're called nightmares is is because of that like they were seen i think in mostly germanic traditions um as like these dark horses that um have have a connection maybe to like the fair folk and like fairies um and like the wild hunt and stuff like that but also like to dreams and and curses and so i really love that we have this throwback to to that lore where these like they're they're made out of smoke and shadows and sand and they're like dark and black with red eyes and kind of like fiery noses um in the movie and and it's just they're fantastic i'm like oh i love i love how the nightmares work in this movie so good yeah uh they're really cool uh i'm just gonna be back in one second here so i can do whatever i want while you're gone excellent <laughs> kyle is not here to stop me this is how it begins my inside takeover of kyle and cody's cult cinema cast begins now <laughs> he can just cut all of this out this ongoing monologue of me talking to you dear listener but i i sincerely hope kyle or whoever is editing this episode curtis perhaps leaves all this in while we wait for kyle to get back from whatever he's doing and i hope that you my friend and listener oh no my cat's knocked over a curtain. Okay, I hope that you, dear friend and listener, use this in some ridiculous way. Just take my voice from the time Kyle says, I'll be back in a second, all the way through here and like splice it up, cut it up, do something crazy with it, turn it into a wrap. I don't care. Just just have fun with it because there is no way <laughs> that Kyle is going to include like five minutes of me just monologuing about bullshit as he goes to do whatever errand he is doing currently so this has been victoria's monologue slash rant on kyle and cody's cult cinema cast thank you so much for joining me all of which will stay on the show completely unedited <laughs> i 
said that. <laughs> I, I said somewhere around like the one minute mark. I hope that Kyle leaves all of this in. <laughs> so yeah, the, he lets out the nightmare to go spread to other dreams, so he get a bunch of goons while he like uh, talks taunts the man in the moon. We get we meet our uh, bunny who uh, does some work to kidnap uh, Jack Frost. So we get a bit of interaction with them. Uh, he gets dragged up to the North Pole. So we get a bit of inter interaction. Uh, they know each other, which is a bit odd. Um, I get it. It's... I mean, they've had 300 years to meet, so that's a fair. Bunny Mund is, like, very suspicious of Jack Frost because they have, like, a history of... Uh, uh, like Jack Frost, like really messing with uh, Easter one year. North appears friendly to ja uh, Jack, and uh, the Tooth Fairy is kind of like crushing on him. So they have a bit of interaction. She really likes his teeth, which are apparently really good for whatever reason. I think I think Tooth Fairy has a bit of a crush on Jack. Actually, I was getting some major flirtation vibes off of her. Yeah, they do a lot of that in this. Um, they don't go anywhere with it. Um, I don't know. She's like probably like 700 years older than him, so that's a thing. So maybe, maybe it's a good thing they don't pursue that romantic interest. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, we'd see how that works in the Easter. Uh, I don't know, hummingbirds don't really survive very well in winter, so there's that. Um, they pres So uh, they've in uh, informed Jack that he's been invited to join the Guardians, and they offer him a pair of shoes, which is odd. They offer him, like, elf shoes that, like, curl up. They're actually quite nice, but, uh, yeah, he rejects it because... Uh, I miss that. I don't have any memory of the elf shoes. They it was very brief. They were on screen for, like, a second. So he is a bit of a stare down with uh, the Easter Bunny, uh, and then it ends with, and then uh, Santa ends the conversation by saying, "Hey Jack, let's go for a walk," um, and he guides uh, Jack into his office, uh, showing him a bit around Santa's workshop. At what point? At some po at the point where they get into the office, uh, Santa goes into like dark mode, and like uh, stares him down. And he's just like. What's your center? What's your what's your big deal? I can't muster up his accent at the moment. That that was not Russian. I will tell you that right now. No, I I <laughs> yeah I, I I'm not gonna bother. So um he explains to him the concept of the center, which is uh essentially like the uh, central focal point of their character and like why they were joined, like uh, chosen to be guardians. Santa's uh, center is wonder. I mentioned that uh, uh, Bunny Muns was hope. Two fairies, I believe, is memory, and uh, Sandy's is dreams, and then um, uh, Pitch Black's is fear. So that's the thing. And like a uh, big center point for the movie is uh, Jack figuring out what his is. Um, this metaphor is um, explained by a series of those Russian uh, dolls within dolls, which was fun. Matryoshka. I don't know what they're called. They're called Matryoshka, Russian stacking dolls. So yeah, they get um, th that explained to us. Um, they're interrupted by a problem at the Tooth Palace, which is uh, Tooth Fairy's uh, house. Um, there is, uh, Pitch Black is apparently attacking the place. So, um, uh, Jack and Bunnyman, uh, get into Santa's sleigh, which is, um, they make a big deal out of. I don't think it's very, uh, all that cool. The reindeer are really beastly, <laughs> which doesn't make a lot of, because reindeer are, like, the friendlier deer. Like, it'd be one thing if they were, like, moose or whatever. Or... I mean, Santa is Canadian, so it would make a lot of sense if his reindeer were moose. You could do elk, um, caribou? Yeah, or caribou, that would make, uh... or car caribou. Caribou would be the most likely, because they live up far north in the tundra, so. Yeah, that could be a thing. Um, so they take off in the sleigh, uh, it's not like a super fast sleigh, it does fly, but, um, they travel around using portals, which is weird, I don't know. So, uh, 
Pitch Black has uh, taken all the hummingbirds and the teeth for uh, so that he can um, make it so that uh, they can't uh, like gather the teeth and that'll weaken uh, Tooth Fairy because they won't believe in her anymore, which bothers people for a night. And then um, the next night, uh, uh, the Guardians do uh, the Tooth Fairy's job overnight and like uh, replace all the teeth with stuff and do the whole Tooth Fairy thing uh, to restore her belief. But um, Pitch has a uh, counterpoint to this in that he has been gathering up uh, nightmares so that he can attack the Guardians who have been uh, put to sleep due to some shenanigans with uh, Sandman's powers, uh, leaving only Sandman and Jack still awake. So they end up having to fight off uh, Pitch and the Nightmares alone, which they do fairly well of. Uh, Sandy handles uh, Pitch Black sort of uh, easily until the Nightmares arrive, and they fight, and they fight, and eventually uh, some sleepy Guardians rejoin the fray. Um, Sandy gets shot in the back by Pitch Black during the fight, and uh, perishes, leaving uh, only bad dreams, which I imagine is... uh, Part of Pitchbox's plan to make his um, lack of belief uh, plan go more smoothly, which he had made a point of uh, target uh, wanting to get a hold of Sandman first. So that's a thing, or like really early on, anyway. So yeah, Sandman's dead. Um, Jack manages to fight off a bunch of the nightmares with his frost powers. Um, so they're kind of relying on him to uh, hold off the nightmares should they attack again. We get a bit of information on uh, the origin of Pitch Black because he has uh, a conversation with uh, Jack about this, and uh, he's trying to join uh, get Jack to join his side because uh, the man, the Moon, has decided to leave his path ambiguous, uh, past ambiguous, and therefore uh, leave him confused and vulnerable to Pitch's uh, manipulations. Although I'll give it this. Jack does shut down Pitch's uh, job offer, which is surprising. Normally, like it'd be a uh, they s- certain uh, packs would have like Jack seriously struggle about this, but Jack's uh, through the whole thing is just like, look, I may not be with these guys too much, but no, you're a bad guy, and I don't uh, side with you. So there's that. I, I I really like that that Jack uh, turns him down even before uh, he uh, starts really chilling with the uh, Guardians a lot. I've I've glo- I'm glossing over a lot of plot points because this is actually a very densely made movie. I thought I got a lot of information a lot uh, very effectively and quick. We also get uh, Jack has decided to uh, side in with the. Uh, guardians because she uh they have uh access to his baby teeth which because uh the tooth fairy is the um her center's memory she could you she could provide him with his baby teeth and you and jack could use his baby teeth to uh regain his memories or re uh read through his memories so that he can know who he is better so that's why he's uh, another reason why he's sticking with them pretty well. It, it's just like five different plot points happened at once, and it was really quick. There's like a scene where like uh, all the where all the guardians go to sleep, and like uh, they were retrieving Jamie's teeth and like a tooth, and because uh, J- uh, Jamie had lost tooth early in the movie, and his little sister wanders into the room and gets a hold of one of uh, Santa's portals, which uh, she uses to. Uh, teleport into uh bunny's uh home base uh and so she ends up there for later in the movie and no one realizes until they get there oh yeah so uh after this they um decide that uh because of their recent loss of sandy they have to go all in on easter so uh all the guardians are going to help out uh getting easter ready so they go back to uh uh, the Easter Bunny's den, and they find uh, the baby, uh, and they find uh, Sophie, the chi- the little sister, who's um toddler age, like uh, maybe preschooler. 
Are you asking for my opinion? Because I, I don't know. Like, I think you're right. Yeah, she's, um... She's, she's not very verbal. Yeah, semi-verbal. So she could be, like, three or whatever. They get a re uh, bunch of the eggs ready. Jack Frost returns uh, Sophie home after uh, a bit of egg painting. And he gets lured away by some voice calling to him. Um, which leads into a hole in the ground underneath a busted up bread frame, which he goes down. Uh, Baby Tooth is with him for whatever reason. Uh, so he falls there and he ends up in uh, the boogeyman's lair. And he finds a big jar of uh, memories, which uh, are contained in like his little tube things. And he goes looking for his uh, in the pile uh, before he uh, ref uh, releases all the uh, hummingbirds, which got captured from the Tooth Palace. Jack off uh, Pitch ends up showing up and uh, offers the memories, but uh, that doesn't. Uh, he gets this whole Cobb story. They resurrect. They point out that like that he points out that uh, Jack and him would make a good team because he's darkness. She uh, Pitch is darkness. Jack is cold. Those go together pretty well. Which is an interesting little bit of symb symb uh, symbology, I think. We get a full rejection. Jack fully re rejects Pitch Black um, and says he doesn't want to be uh, feared, even if it means he doesn't get believed in. Uh, he uh, Pitch has captured Baby Tooth and uh, says that uh, Baby Tooth he'll trade Baby Tooth for uh, Jack's staff, which is apparently a source of his power. So. Uh, Pitch gets a hold of the staff, uh, breaks it, and then uh, leaves it behind, which is a bit of a mistake. I mean that on every level. I think it's a mistake on Pitch's part, because obviously Jack is going to be able to repair it. Um, it's just, and it's a mistake on the filmmaker's part, because then they could have had a scene where like he forges a new staff, and it turns out that the power was within him all along, and I think that would have been narrat more narratively better. I 100% agree. I totally, totally had that thought. As soon as Pitch breaks the staff and tosses it into the the cavern, I was like, what is he doing? Like, did he miss villain, like, orientation 101, where they say, don't give the magical weapon back to the people? And also, from a film perspective, I love the idea of him being able to, like, manifest his powers in, in his own creative way instead of with the staff. But you do really quickly find out why the staff is important, right? So it, he kind of needs, like, the, the shepherd's crook staff to, like, um, to grow as well. So so I, I kind of get why they left it, right? There's an argument. I think it could have uh, done something else. But, yeah, it's, yeah, there's points on both sides, I think. So uh, while he's stuck in the uh, this chasm where in like a chasm of ice where he's been thrown, uh, he decides to read his uh, read into his memories, which uh, Pitch had just handed to him. He had been uh, and he gets to relive how he ended up dying. He had uh, been taking his sister skating on the ice, and uh, and uh, it ended up with. Uh, the ice starting to crack and they're all scared and they like don't want to move and he's trying and he uh does a lot to calm his sister and uh tell her that uh they're gonna play a game in order to calm her down and he uses the um a nearby fallen tree branch which is kind of his uh which is his wizard staff and uses it to uh throw the little sister not all the way to the shore but moves her out of danger and he ends up falling through the ice in the process, which is what kills him. And that's, at this point, he realizes that his center is fun, which is represent, which has been demonstrated by him, like causing these snowball fights and making people want to have fun. And uh, he brings up the example of snow days um, as a way to like cancel school and give kids a break in the middle of winter where things can be rough. But I just want to, I just, I'm like, okay. Y'all, like, Jack Frost can kindly F off here in the middle of 
Canada where we get like not this year we haven't gotten crazy snow this year yet but like I remember Christmases where I was stranded off of my farm like every second weekend because there was too much snow so I was thinking as like Jack Frost is like you think I'm all about um I'm all about fun and snow and have a great time skating right like he's all that's my center is fun I was like I don't know. Snow's not always fun, bro. <laughs> like, like I, I have pictures literally of my truck, like buried under snow, stuck. My four wheel, like four by four truck, stuck in a drift of snow, and my husband and I like getting down in the snow to like dig it out. And in minus forty, that is not fun. <laughs> so I was kind of like, yeah, your center is fun. If you're like not in Canada, <laughs> stupid. Well, I mean, uh, he's not doing this for you, an adult. Well, <laughs> I also have safety concerns that I will follow up with now because <laughs> blizzards are not safe <laughs> for children. <laughs> I'm like, if if your vehicle gets stuck in a snowdrift and you've got kids in the vehicle, that ain't fun for anyone. Just saying. Anyway, I was like, it was funny because I, I must have watched this like in 2012. I would have, I would have, was I still in high school? I think I was still in high school. So like the idea of a snow day would, would be kind of fun, even in high school, right? Like snow days are fun. I totally get that. But then now that it's like X amount of years later, eight years later or whatever, and I'm like, a commuting adult and I have to drive on the highway every day to get to work. I'm like, I hate snow. Snow's the worst. <laughs> Jack Frost is stupid. I, pr That's I probably would have had to uh, feed bales on these days, to be fair, also. <laughs> yeah, you weren't you weren't uh, having magical snowball fights? No, I I'm pretty sure I still had to go outside and do chores. My parents were also both teachers, and so, ah. like, I, I I do think most snow days, they gave us a choice. Like when, when I was in elementary school, most snow days, because we were bus kids. So if buses were canceled, my parents would be like, well, do you guys want to stay home? And we had like, oh my goodness, this is going to make me sound so pretentious. But we had a live-in nanny. And so for, I think, three years. So like the years that I wouldn't have been old enough to stay home alone, we had a live-in nanny to like, take care of my youngest sister who's considerably younger than me and so we were usually given a choice of if we wanted to stay home and like hang out with our nanny and sister um or if we wanted to go to school so like I think I think though I ended up going to school more often than staying home because going to school on snow days was fun too right like there was no one there usually the teacher put on a movie <laughs> Like, it was pretty chill. So, okay. I'm going back on my, I'm like doubling back on my earlier rant about how stupid snow days were. And how dangerous snow is. Now I'm like, oh yeah, I can totally get behind a snow day. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. I just, different lens. Different lens. Yeah. So uh, after this, he re uh, refuses his staff back together with ice and uh, goes to save the Hummers. Which is what I'm calling the hummingbirds now. Okay. Because and, uh, this, this because this movie is short on weird nicknames, you just need to add one more to the mix. Yes. Okay. So um yeah, it's revealed that all the uh Easter eggs were destroyed, so everyone's gonna stop believing. Uh Bunnymund is like really angry with uh Jack. So that's a thing. Um, he wasn't there to protect the uh, eggs as they went. So all the eggs essentially just got destroyed uh, as they left the... Oh yeah, the eggs walk around. I should probably mention that. The eggs are just like walking around. So they were just going to walk around and like stop wherever they need to be hidden. And they just got destroyed on their way out. The imagery around Easter really confuses me because you've got bunnies and, and chickens, like chicken eggs, and they don't really go together nicely like it doesn't quite make sense and so these little easter eggs like they're not only on 
they're not only walking, which is the stuff of nightmares, but they're they're walking on like these two little like chicken legs, like sentient chicken legs. And so it's really actually quite disturbing. Like I, I don't like I don't like the Easter domain underground with Bunny, although I do love his Australian accent because it's it's weird it's like really weird and kind of uncomfortable and i'm like all i can think of is like these little eggs being like Meh! as they like walk around and hide themselves it was like disturbing to watch we get a scene of like uh pitch like dancing around a globe as like the last of uh the kids in the world stop believing in the guardians uh and uh, he dances around, and of course, the last kid who believes is an American. We got to have that American main character. It's Jamie, to be fair. They've already set this up, but uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like by movie slash Hollywood rules, aliens only ever attack in America, and all like magical children's stories happen in America too. So, you know, it's like. In line so, yeah. with all movie rules. I don't know. There's a bunch of English ones, to be fair, I think. Um, For magic, yeah, but, like, name one alien story that's set in, like, the UK. Doctor Who? Oh, fuck you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Damn it! Damn it, damn it, damn it! Besides Doctor Who, which... <laughs> I don't know if it qualifies as, like, an alien story. Uh, the Quartermass Experiment. I think that's what it's I've called. I've never seen that. I have no Quarter idea mass. what that is. Uh, so it doesn't exist. It's black and white. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> then it definitely doesn't exist. It, it's, like, same era as, like, very early Doctor Who. Like, first Doctor, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, it's like a TV nice. movie. It's supposed okay, to be pretty well, good. What I'm saying is that our Hollywood media is very, like, American-centric. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing. I'm sure it is, but... So, yeah, Jack's uh, overseeing Jamie, who's the last kid who believes on Earth. And uh, Jack's trying to make him believe. He, like, draws on uh, uh, Jamie's window by frosting it up. And that... Uh, makes like a whole bunny thing and eventually uh jack's been able to interact with the physical world which is weird um he's just not they're not just not able to actually see him so when he does the whole bunny thing that uh causes uh uh jamie to be able to see him so that uh means that people finally believe in jack frost so yeah jack frost is a person kids believe in now so uh he brings them in and uh, we get caught up with the rest of the Guardians. Everyone's been weakened. The bunny, bunny, uh, Bunnyman has been hurt the most because he's uh, swank into an adorable with a bunny wabbit. Which is, is really great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like six something normally, but now he's just like a juicy with a bunny wabbit. It's it's pretty fantastic actually. And I I I remember watching this with I think it was with my nephew once and like he loved that the bunny rabbit or like the Easter bunny was this giant like huge bunny. Like he thought that was so fantastic and then was so upset <laughs> when the Easter bunny <laughs> was made into this like little diminutive tiny fluff ball and was just pissed he was so bad and i was like this is great like this was worth every moment of watching this movie was just that payoff to see how angry he got my my nephew got so great yeah. i can i can yeah. see that i can see that santa's kind of limping too so he's lost a bunch of power the uh sleigh's not really flying all around and then we gear up for our final showdown in which uh bunnyman uh where uh pitch uh gets all the nightmares together and uh uh start to essentially kill the guardians so that he can be the only one who's believed in so uh he gets the idea uh jack's able to fight them off for a little bit but he's um not as powerful now and uh 
uh, pitch has become far more powerful. Jack gets the idea, which would be a bad idea in any other movie, but he's going to um, bring more children into this very dangerous situation. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. All my... All my protective instincts are like that. That was really stupid, Jack. Like, what? A, what a dumb thing to do. It's like the middle of the night, and he's like, "Hey, children, come outside." In the cold. In the cold. Yeah. Some of them aren't wearing shoes. So he brings out the kids to get into like snowballs, so like so they can um, convert the nightmares back into dreams, and this allows more kids to start believing in the guardians, which causes them to uh, gain their strength back. And uh, Bunny turns uh, out uh, turns into a normal rabbit. So and uh, them and the kids like turning the nightmares back into dreams. Uh, eventually rev revive Sandy, who has um I think we, has been established as being like inherently a bit more powerful than uh, Pitch because he's dreams and uh, Pitch is nightmares. So he's able to overcome them on that front. So uh, that shows. Uh, them doing it and eventually uh pitch gets knocked unconscious and dreams about birds and then like does the whole uh birds flying around his head thing to symbolize him dreaming so that kind of like also uh doubles down that uh sandy is more powerful than pitch so yeah they've managed to reverse the effects of uh pitch's efforts pitch runs off and he ends up on a frozen lake which is where the final scene in the movie takes place takes place on what the fuck like yeah let's we've just established that like you can fall through frozen lakes so let's bring everyone onto this frozen lake and like hope that doesn't apply to the rest of the story they could have set this like five feet away on the snow but they brought everyone else on uh, brought everyone onto this unsafe surface that looks disturbingly like the place where jack died i was gonna say and doesn't it look doesn't it look exactly like the place where jack died like it's like almost the same animation <laughs> and so i was like well that's an interesting choice like all these kids in there some of them in their bare feet on the ice like watching the end of the the conflict happen and i'm like wouldn't jack be like yo kids don't stand on the ice that's dangerous yeah and yeah in this movie we're like Falling through the ice is a, clearly a thing you should be afraid of. So that's there too. And then um, I find out that the Justice League movie ripped off its ending from this. Like, what the fuck, Snyder? What the fuck, uh, Snyder and or Whedon? So, yeah, um, there's a few what? nightmares left. And, yeah, and the night... Um, well, okay, so here's what happens. The nightmares... Uh, feed are can like smell fear that's been established and they're like tracking people down based on their fear and like expanding on that and uh the last of the nightmares are still wandering around and uh they're coming after pitch because he's the only one who's afraid still and uh this is the same thing that happens at the end of justice league the justice league movie uh where um all the demogor uh, the parademons go after stefan wolf because uh, Superman makes him afraid. I actually, I actually haven't seen Justice League, which, which is fine. But the reason is because I love Justice League so much. I didn't want to see a movie like a bad movie of it. <laughs> so it's not bad. It's just like not like super. It's basically it's neutral not great either. Right. Yeah, so, it's not like see, that, that I would. I wouldn't, like, include it with a conversation of, like, the worst comic book movies, but it's, like, meh, middle of the road, fine. It just makes me sad, because I, I, I love, like, like, DC comics are my fave. I grew up loving, like, the DCU and, and just, like, the animated Justice League series and, and, like, short movies and stuff like that, and so... I, I love Justice League <laughs> and and I would I'm just really sad that it wasn't like amazing <laughs> because I feel like they're a really great superhero team and I want them to be amazing. So I haven't actually watched it. Well hopefully the Snyder Cup's good. We'll see about that. Um so yeah, that's a thing I found out when I watched this uh yesterday. So yeah, um and then 
Jack's about to leave, uh, like, about to leave with the Guardians, and he gives a little speech to uh, Jamie about, like, hey, him being gone will, how, what if I stop believing, you're going to be going, what if I stop believing in you? And I'm like, okay, that's a valid concern based on how this movie works. Um, Jack does explain that, like, um, him going is like, okay, you don't need to be afraid about the moon not coming up because it goes down every night. Which would have been a good fucking thing to bring up earlier in the movie. Uh, sure, yeah. Like, I, I think it it was done nicely here, though. Like, it was, it was, like, poignant and it made a lot of sense. And I actually, I think he could have just left it there. Like, I think if he'd left with, like, left it off with a moon like analogy that would have been really nice but then he goes one step further and he says something about like you don't stop believing the sun when it's cloudy outside and i was like well you already illustrated your point and it was more poignant because it was about the moon and we've been talking about the man in the moon this entire movie like i think it would have just been punchier if they'd left it there instead of adding like two more lines of dialogue that were redundant and like less poignant i guess anyway that's my issue with how it was done but i think it was good and they clearly do all stop believing in them when they don't go away because they were gone they were all gone for like a day and everyone then they all almost died so clearly that's something they really needed to hear that like hey look sometimes shit happens i'm not gonna be able to make it home for christmas this year it's fine don't worry i'll be here next year yeah, that's really something that needs to be said at the beginning. If if Kyle were to write children's movies, shit happens, kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's... <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and then the movie ends with another uh, kind of like monologue from Jack uh, to the audience. And he's just like, when the moon tells you something, believe it. And I'm like, but the moon didn't tell anyone anything. <laughs> Because it doesn't fucking talk. talk. <laughs> yeah, it didn't tell you anything. This is a serious point. It didn't tell you anything. That was the entire plot of the movie. Ah, uh, that's funny. Yeah, no, that was a thing. So, what the fuck off with this shit? Uh, and that was... And that was Rise of the Guardians! Are we going to try to say it at the same time? No. Have we ever done that on the show? No. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, maybe it could be our thing, Kyle. <laughs> so, thoughts? After thoughts? Uh, I think it looks pretty good. It's still a bit like... Um, I think this came out before... Um, like, Yeah, it, it, this looks it's a pretty well-made-out movie. Um, it does look choppy in places, but that just could have been my screen. The animation is all right. Uh, the particle effects do look really good. There's a lot of re uh, really well, uh, it's well thought out. It's just maybe, uh, not like technically beautiful in the way some other films can be. Um, I think it's pretty good. It's, um, upper tier DreamWorks stuff, I think. I've watched enough of their stuff to say that. That's, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. I'm, like, thinking about other DreamWorks, like, animated shows that I've watched recently, and I can't think of any besides Shrek. So, I mean, like, from an animation standpoint, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's, uh... This maybe could have been hand-drawn and looked a little bit better, I think. I could see that. This does have a bit of a following. It's just never quite, uh burst into the scene um i can see some uh like audience members like really liking it uh jack frost seems like the type of character that a bunch of teenage girls would really get into uh hey this teenage <laughs> girl is really into jack frost except for when he's dangerous because of snow days but <laughs> No, I, I, I think like there's something charming about his character. I, I, I enjoy a, a broody boy. <laughs> so there is definitely a following of characters who are really obsessed with Jack, or a following of fans that are really obsessed with Jack Frost. And like, 
I've seen a bunch of like cross cross um movie ships like a bunch of people ship Jack Frost with Elsa from Frozen right because they've got similar power sets um I've also seen like weird mashups between like Jack Frost and Merida from Brave and Rapunzel for some reason I'm not exactly sure what that is but like people people have definitely used him in fan art and fanfic and content um fan content around like the other princesses and and kind of similar aged um characters I guess so I don't know I like I kind of I kind of dig a, a Elsa Jack Frost ship like in some ways because I, I think it's kind of fun that they've got similar powers but I'd, I'd really love them to be like cool bros like friends because because they think they could teach each other things i'd be cool yeah so this has a following it just hasn't made a needs another shot at making the money i think it could be it could maybe make a comeback i don't know maybe like a tv show could it be okay for this Mm -hmm. yeah that would be kind of cool i don't know if i'd watch a tv show though like like maybe if my future children wanted to watch this as a tv show then that would be fine but i don't think i'd actually go out of my way to watch it you know not like she-ra and the princesses of power that i will watch forever and ever until the day i die amen that is a good show it's fantastic it's the best show yeah i don't know what what do you give the movie i've talked about ratings i've talked about money so i think we'll go into ratings oh man like i I don't think it's, I don't think it's a horrible movie. Like I, it's entertaining and it's cute. And like compared to some of the other movies that you've made me watch, he actually gave me a choice this time. He let me pick which, which Jack Frost movie I wanted to watch, which I appreciate. But compared to some of the other movies I've watched for the podcast, like this one was like decent, you know, it was entertaining. It was cute. Um, I think it explores some interesting themes like, like memory, death, loss, grief, like childhood. So like there's some there's all some really good stuff in there that I enjoy. But then on the same like at the same time, it's not a movie that I'm like, oh, I'm gonna watch this every like holiday season or or this is so great that I'm going to obsess over it like I've obsessed over other animated children's movies. So I think I'd give it like maybe a five, like it's, it's pretty squarely in the middle for me, maybe a 5.5, 5, a little bit closer to a six. I, I could, I could give it a six. I'm going to give it a six. Yeah. Final answer. Okay. Yeah. I'm giving it a seven. I think it's just on the cusp, but like, I don't know. It's a low seven, but I think it's, mm-hmm. um, couple, maybe like rethinking of this and it might be really good. I just don't think it's quite there. I don't think the world's been like thoroughly thought through enough. There were also like just some like the occasional like dumb tropes. I really didn't like the uh, Santa portal thing. I didn't see why that was um, necessary. I'm not a fan of like uh, portals as uh, travel, like in that sense. I just didn't. I just thought like really fast sleigh would have been way cooler. I don't know. We're both a bit below curve. And you hated the man in the moon. Yeah, I didn't like him either. Um, there's enough in this to keep me from giving it like a six, but I, I'm putting it at seven. We're both below curve on this. It's like 7.3 on IMDb, 75% of Rotten Tomatoes. See, that seems that seems really high to me. Like a seven, a, a 75, is that what you said on Rotten Tomatoes? Like, that seems really high. <laughs> But yeah, okay. I mean, Rotten Tomatoes isn't a good metric, but uh, for anything, but um, we're yeah, we're a bit below curve, and I think like I I, I think it's mostly like fans watching it, like obviously like in a small movie like this, I think there's a bit of like, oh yeah, just people that a lot of people just don't watch it and just didn't like uh get like the desire to watch it, so I think that's a bit of it. Sorry, I just I was just looking it up on like Common Sense Media to see kind of what the reviews looked like there, and it's like four out of five stars. I didn't realize that they didn't do numbered reviews, but like that would still skew higher than I think what we kind of yeah that would be like an eighty percent. So 
<laughs> that's really okay sorry um on common sense media the first thing <laughs> the first thing that it says is parents need to know that rise of the guardians is sort of like the avengers with childhood icons <laughs> so that i feel like our comic book conversations that we've had the entire way through this this are you know justified based on that one line alone yeah i just don't think it, it needed some little bit of a once over to like push it over to the edge i think Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree with you like i think that i think that things could have been like ramped or like amped up a little bit like that there could have been um it has so much potential to be a lot better and maybe that's why i'm kind of like well it wasn't really higher than a six for me <laughs> um because because i think it could be a really really epic movie but, but I'm also happy that it has its following. Like, I'm happy that there are people who really enjoy it and have put it higher, you know, on the ratings and stuff like that. And that there's a lot of fan content generated out of it. And so, so I respect that. I, I like that this has found its, its people. That's cool. I think that's where we call it. Um, where can they find you, Victoria? Yes, yeah. People can find me online at www.victoriacoops that's k-o-o-p-s dot com or on social media at Victoria Coops Writes. I'm on Instagram and Facebook primarily but I do have a lurky Twitter account that I mostly just read other people's tweets on and I'm a young adult writer and so I'm really working on um, building my kind of writing platform and, and getting people interested in the stories I'm hoping to share with the world soon. So it would be awesome if people could go over to my Facebook and Instagram and like follow along and see the writing adventures I'm going on. Um, you can find, uh, again, you can find the podcast at Kylan Coe's Called Cinema Cast on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Casey Cinema Pod. Uh, you can find my personal Twitter at uh, Lord Brokenshire, and then you can find Cody's uh, Twitter and Twitch channel at The Real Cody Upman, where we do streams occasionally. And then, uh, yeah, um, next week or maybe a little bit later, I might delay that depending on uh, how things go. But I intend to do uh, 2004 uh, uh re revisit the uh sub theme of the season of the worst movies to win best picture with the 2004 movie crash so that's where we're at with that and then victoria will be back uh middle of the way through january probably yeah so that'll be uh yeah so keep an eye out for that um we will see you next week bye guys